The death of John Kennedy Jr. was a terrible loss. The loss of his wife Carolyn and her sister Lauren was an unspeakable blow to their families and the other people who loved them. John embodied an extremely rare combination of wealth, charisma, and human decency. As we have seen and will see, the Kennedy family members have lived and died giving their best in service to the people of America and to the world. What might John and Carolyn have done for their country and the world if they had lived? Let's try not to get lost in the swamp of facts surrounding their deaths. And let's try instead to stay rooted in an appreciation of what we lost when they died. In getting started, there are some preliminary points we should discuss. The first has to do with understanding the forces at work in recent and current U.S. history. State-sponsored racism and genocide were invented by the rich and powerful in this country and their involvement with Hitler cannot be overestimated. For example, Chase Manhattan Bank, the Rockefeller Bank in Paris, seized the assets of their Jewish depositors and then ordered Hitler to tell them to do it. Which, of course, he did. The Nazis who run this country ordered Hitler around. Hitler represented a dictatorship of the rich bastards, of the largest corporations, of the power elite against the Democrats, who think society ought to be run by the people and for the benefit of the people. But the most powerful Nazis were not in Germany, they were right here. The Rockefellers and the Harrimans, the Fords and the DuPonts helped to create Hitler, helped to promote him and armed him. And they didn't lose World War II. Hitler did, the German people did, the Jewish people did. But the Rockefellers and the Harrimans, the Fords and the DuPonts, they won. After eight years as president in 1960, Eisenhower finally figured out that he was surrounded by Nazis. He called them the military-industrial complex, and he tried to warn the new president, John Kennedy, that these guys were trying to take over the government and end democracy. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. The Kennedy family has a truly amazing history. Joe, the oldest son, died in a bomber over Germany fighting Nazis. Jack died fighting the Nazis here, the military-industrial complex. They wanted the Vietnam War as an excuse to loot the U.S. Treasury. When as president, John Kennedy Sr. opposed them, they shot him down like a dog in the streets of Dallas. Bobby Kennedy, the third brother, took up the fight against the military-industrial complex and ran for president promising to end the Vietnam War that his brother was murdered for opposing. Bobby was murdered after winning the California primary. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. The murder, as usual, was blamed on a lone nut, Sirhan Sirhan. But the L.A. County coroner, Thomas Noguchi, said that the powder burns on the back of Robert Kennedy's head indicated that the shot was fired from within one inch. We came to conclusion that the muzzle distance would be as a uh, one inch from the right uh, ear edge. But the eyewitnesses all said that Sir Han never came near enough to deliver the fatal shot to the back of the head. And Sir Han was right in front of me, uh, right in front of this team table and between me. In so front? In front, yeah. I had him right in front of me. I didn't let him pass me. I had my left foot on his knees and now he pushed him over on the, the well, time. Well, how far would the gun muzzle be from Senator Kennedy's head? About a foot and a half, I would say, foot and a half, two feet. More shots were fired than Sir Han's gun was capable of firing. Sir Han said he did not remember firing the shots and that he had absolutely no reason to hate Robert Kennedy. Many investigators concluded that Sir Han was a victim of mind control, a decoy sent to divert attention while the real killer fired the fatal shot. Edward Kennedy, the fourth brother, after becoming a senator, barely escaped death in a plane crash that broke his back and killed everyone else on board. 
and his political career was ruined when someone drugged him and drove his car off a bridge. He survived, but his hopes to run for president did not. This is not some stupid, mysterious family curse. For 50 years, the Kennedys have had a heroic family tradition of fighting real Nazis, of defending the democratic interests of the people against other families with anti-democratic traditions. These Nazis have been instrumental in the murders of the Kennedys. These Nazis, the Illuminati, the rich bastards, they are the Kennedy curse. The death of John Kennedy Jr. must be seen in this light. Who would want to kill a harmless boob like John Kennedy Jr.? It's a common question that needs to be answered. John was not a harmless boob, and the men who murdered John's father had good reason to fear that he would go after his father's killers. John was not your average stupid spoiled rich kid. For example, this was his birthday. He was three. Not your average birthday party. All the women were dressed in black. His mama was no fool. Minutes after the assassination, they wanted her to change her dress. She said, no, I want the American people to see what they did to my husband. What they did to my husband. She didn't buy any of this lone nut crap. She did her best to help her children grow up normal and healthy. She didn't send them away to one of those factories where they manufacture rich kids into sick and twisted upper class scum. She tried hard to keep them normal. But when John wanted to be an actor, she let him know that he had more serious work to do. George Magazine was that work. Infotainment, but real info. Not the stupidifying garbage you get on 150 channels of cable. Entertaining, engaging, but smart and real and important. Perhaps too smart, too real, and too important. He published at least two very, very dangerous articles. The first was written by the mother of the assassin of Yitzhak Rabin, the liberal, peace-seeking prime minister of Israel. This woman said that Rabin's assassination was a plot engineered by the Mossad, the Israeli CIA. She argued, essentially, that her son was a tool of the Mossad, that he could never have penetrated the security around Rabin if it weren't an inside job. Wow. Publishing an article that encourages people to consider the possibility that their own security might be involved in attacks on their own citizens based on the fact that those attacks could not have succeeded if the security agencies had done their jobs. I don't think we can overemphasize this point. John Kennedy devoted his life to trying to bring the people the whole dangerous truth. He paid for this devotion to the people and to the truth with his life. A few minutes after the interview with Richard Stanley, Todd Bergen, the Coast Guard information officer, said the same thing, that he and the Coast Guard didn't have any radar information. Yes. And that's the last time the plane was heard from? That is correct. At approximately 2,500 feet, 10 miles offshore? That's my understanding. Uh, I, I, like I said, as far as that, that radar location, I do not have that information. Officer, is there anything that I feel? Remember at the Pentagon News Conference, at about 1.30, Colonel Rourke insisted that despite the radar information, that they were not focusing on one area. We'll, we'll continue on the same track that we're on, uh, which is to search the entire area. All these people say there was no information that would lead to a focused search of the waters off Martha's Vineyard, and yet Richard Stanley says... Correct, yes. Yeah. I saw the Coast Guard out there. That's the only thing I had that would hint in that direction. Okay, yeah. Uh, there are... No one was focusing on the crash site, but Stanley says he saw what he took to be the Coast Guard conducting a focused search off the west coast of Martha's Vineyard early in the morning. But that's not possible. In fact, just to be clear, the Coast Guard says it wasn't them. But if it wasn't the Coast Guard, then who was it? Well, we have an answer to that now, don't we? Granted, the evidence in this case is circumstantial. But that doesn't make it crazy to bring George W. up on charges. Crazy? Hell, it's not even unusual. It is part one of the absolutely basic standard operating procedure for any criminal prosecution, a two-step process that has put tens of thousands of Americans, perhaps hundreds of thousands, in prison today using less evidence than can be presented in this case. Step one of the process is to review the evidence, so let's do that quickly. One, the guy's father was a murderer. 
John's refusal to accept the official version of his father's murder, his promotion of Oliver Stone, his commitment to publishing bold and important truths about the crimes committed by governments against their own citizens, and his real potential to seek and win high government office all made John a very real threat to the monsters who killed his father. 2. Bush Sr. earned the oil mafia support for his presidency by killing John Kennedy Sr. His reward for participating in this murder was not only a place at the table of these killers, but, as we have seen, their guaranteed, undying support for his political career no matter how many times he lost. They picked him up, sewed him back together, and promoted him to higher and higher positions of political power. 3. Georgie is clearly now a leading member of this oil mafia, secretly sworn to serve their interests. While he has been president, the oil mafia's profits and prospects have soared through the roof. Of course, the American people pay. He may only be a stooge at this table, but he is a stooge not only with a seat, but with his own little nameplace marker at the table of this mafia that you have to earn your membership in by committing a murder. So point four in the evidence is that George W., like his father, would also have to kill somebody to five get the oil mafia to support him instead of McCain and to get a place at their table, like his father before him. So who? That's the obvious question, isn't it? It should be the obvious question. Who do you suppose these sick and twisted bastards decided Georgie should kill to make his bone? They decided, The father kills a father, the son should kill the son. They liked the poetry of it. We have proved that John Kennedy Jr. was murdered. Can any reasonable person look at this mountain of evidence in the death of JFK Jr. and not see clear, unmistakable signs of foul play? We have part one of the requirements to bring this case to court. Very powerful circumstantial evidence, the only explanation for which is murder. Now, the best explanation, the most reasonable explanation, the most probable explanation for the available evidence will be accepted as proof in a criminal case if and only if it is also the only reasonable explanation. That is, if the only other explanation is ridiculously and unreasonably improbable, leaving no reasonable doubt. If this were a court case, George W. Bush would have to prove a reasonable alternative explanation for the facts we have presented here. He'd have to give a reasonable explanation for why the Dark Lord supported a coke-addled, draft-dodging loser instead of John McCain. He'd have to explain the FAA's ignoring of Senator Kennedy and Rourke's lies and that absolutely amazing fuel selector valve. He'd have to present a reasonable alternative explanation for these unusual events, or da 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 He would have to provide an alibi for where he was on July 16, 1999, and he doesn't have one. Why the hell didn't his staff know where he was? Was he in bed with Colin, or was he in bed with Condoleezza, or both? Or was he in a boat with Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Richard Myers in the waters off Martha's Vineyard, waiting for a plane to come down. In any case, it's very simple. All Georgie has to do is provide a credible alibi. But you know, this is not an easy thing for a guy like Bush. Wherever he says he was, we're going to want to know who was with him. All of those people he might name lead very public lives. They never carry cash. There are dozens of credit card transactions providing evidence of where they all were that weekend. The people who work at the hotels and restaurants where he might claim to have stayed would remember whether he was there the day John Kennedy Jr. died. Who was he with? His friends all have secretaries who keep their calendars of where they were. Do you think all of those calendars of all of those people are going to match his? Not if they are all lying. Remember, these are the guys who screw up everything they touch. For example, George's father claims that he knew nothing about the Iran-Contra weapons cocaine terrorism scandal and Bush's personal calendar slash date book shows him out of town on the dates that the meetings were held to plan these crimes. But Ollie North, who did all the day-to-day -day grunt work of this dark and murderous business, he also had a calendar slash date book, and his book shows that Bush chaired the planning meetings. So let Georgie answer the question, where were you? And when he does, and it's proved a lie, the same thing will happen to him that happens to every other person accused of murder based on circumstantial evidence when their alibi is proved to be a lie. He'll be convicted. The United States and the world, really, is infested with a cancer, a sick criminal mafia. These people invented state-sponsored race-based slavery and racism. 
They killed Lincoln so that they could then instigate a war of extermination against the Plains Indians. In the 1900s, these sick and twisted racist killers instituted immigration quotas to keep inferior races out of the USA, like the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, and the Chinese. These racist monsters didn't just support Hitler, they created Hitler. The Holocaust was a disaster for the German war effort, but these vermin made a trillion dollars off of it. Hitler lost World War II, but they won. A few years later, they murdered John Kennedy in hopes of making another trillion dollars off the Vietnam War. If you don't know that they blew up the World Trade Center, you're not trying hard enough. Certainly, in the aftermath of 9-11, they have picked our pockets for several hundred billion dollars more. The Patriot Act makes it look as though they plan to permanently destroy democracy in America. Their plans for the environment are threatening the very existence of the human race. What are you going to do about it? Whatever it is, you better get on it. Martin Luther King said it. These sickles are only powerful when good people do nothing. Cesar Chavez said it. These turds are only powerful if we let them be. I can't say it better than this guy. Now is the time to fight this dehumanization. Now is the time to realize you're special and you have power and you can affect change and that we're in a war for the very future of humanity. It's that important. And you're a soldier on the front line. So get out there and take it back to them, 110%. You don't have a choice, ladies and gentlemen. Run your own life or somebody else is gonna run it for you. For the sake of your children and grandchildren, don't keep silent. At the very least, school them. Give them this video. Give them the tools, the knowledge they need to take up this fight if they have the courage. This video is their real history. It may be the only real history they'll ever get in their lives. Your action, even if it's only telling your own children, is real history in the making. So go out and make some history.